So good morning to everybody. And first of all, congratulations to Business School Mannheim for this lecture, because for me, this is a very historic moment um, that we have such a lecture at universities. It's at the forefront of the entire global development. And you as students, just congratulations to you that you chose this kind of lecture because this is the future. Sustainability no longer is a topic of a department. What I will show during the next half hour or so is why choosing this lecture was the most clever decision that you ever did in your life. Now, let me talk about uh, value and how value will be created for the future. Now, maybe I can just like this. Okay, so for sustainability, um, this topic has been evolving. Yeah, I mean, ESF started first, for example, to collect environmental data already 30, 40 years ago. Uh, when looking at uh, kind of environmental data, the first ones, what water emissions means and stuff like that. But um, what we basically see when you look at this chart on the right hand on the left hand side from your side, that since 2009, the requests that came from customers have significantly increased. So overall, what we basically see is the number of surveys that they request from companies is heavily increasing. Now it's better to see. And we are far beyond 247. And this is just questions from the entire industry to companies like us. And they continuously would like to know more. How do you handle your responsible business conduct? What is your supply chain like? What are your handlings and processes for CO2 emission handling and, and, and. And by the way, this is not only a topic that came from the customer side, it's increasingly a highly political topic at the top of all the agendas worldwide. So what we show you here is that basically Xi Jinping has already announced that China would like to become carbon neutral before 2060. But also Joe Biden clearly, clearly puts an emphasis now on the topic saying we will put America back leading the world on climate change or climate related topics. And now Europe, when we think about Europe, and I would like to make one major statement here first, you know, I don't know how long you observed Europe as or the EU Commission. There's a lot of discussion, usually it's a lot of criticism, but this is a historic because for the first time, at least that I know, Europe has developed a very clear vision of what they want to become. They clearly state um, the Green Deal is their, you know, Europe's man of the moon moment, which is kind of really, really historic because the European Union has decided to spend more than a trillion to foster this change. And if I say a trillion, that's five times uh, the Marshall Plan at that time. Yeah? So it's really it's really historic, the money, the funding that goes into the transformation. So here are just the main key points. It's the first climate neutral continent that they intend to be, but also leading the way to a circular economy, which you heard, I guess, over the last days, what this really means, but also moving to a zero pollution environment. This is a tough cookie for a lot of industries at the moment. I don't want to deny this comes with tremendous risks for the industries. And this, this is why dialogue between industry and politicians is increasingly important and accelerating, for example, the sustainable food system. This is what people publicly partially know, right? What I brought you today is much more details. What does this really mean and why was investing in this lecture so clever from you? Now, what we have done since May last year, we have analyzed more than 250 regulations. And why did we do this? Because when you look at this kind of timeline, you can see in the chart, almost every month, the EU Commission came out with new regulations and guidelines. You see on the chart from Green Deal transitioning, the climate topic is on there, biodiversity will be pushed. We have farm to fork, new nutrition systems will come up, but also battery management of you know recycling and all kinds of industry related topics. We have never seen such a tremendous range of strategy papers that were published by the EU Commission. And this means major topics and major regulation frameworks are currently changing as we speak. And by the way, 
Europe is currently front runner. But Japan, for example, has already taken over part of these regulations. And there is a public global debate on these topics. So a lot of countries by now watch what the European Commission pushes at this moment. What is still missing a little bit, I would say, is how to implement the whole thing, right? The dialogues with industries could be improved. And this is why you, going forward in the future, will play such an important role how to implement this, because the wish lists, as you can see here, are rather long. Now, let me give you an insight um, what kind of regulation papers did we analyze. So what you basically see here are the 11 levers of the Green Deal that goes from farm to fork, which is basically about the whole value chain of food, but also circle economy, the topic that you learned kind of this week a little bit more about, and uh, clean and reliable um, energy, affordable energy. By the way, affordable is very important because the challenge here is a lot of people in the EU Commission kind of think about it, but maybe on a European level, problem is most of the industries are interconnected globally, our markets are global, so the, the, the basic challenge will be how to embed this in a global energy framework. It has to be cost competitive and sustainable at the same time. And later you will learn different countries will do different strategies towards this. For example, China is looking in a transition phase, even with nuclear power, which is not the case for Europe. This is the cost level we are competing with. And then you have topics like zero pollution, as mentioned before, climate neutrality, which is a major challenge for the industry, because this means, just to give a little bit more light to the topic, major transitions in plant structures, major transitions also in technology and innovation. Now, what did we find? This is a rather exclusive snapshot for you because what you see in this chart is just the upper layer of the defined targets by the EU Commission in the framework of the Green Deal. And what you see here is they are extremely precise. So I said, or <laughs> you said, uh, I'm responsible for the agriculture solutions business. And this is a real challenge if chemical plant production products will be reduced by 50%. And this is why I said, this whole transformation comes with a tremendous risk, 50% of our business gone. How do we in future guarantee that we nutrition the world? Giving you just some figures on that. The arable land worldwide has been reduced by almost 40% due to climate change, droughts, all kinds of weather conditions. At the same time, during the last 20 years, population has grown significantly. We are now at more than 7 billion and reaching the 10 billion, which means we still have a delta of 3 billion people to be fed uh, well in all kinds of geographies, while certain geographies are not able to provide, you know, the, the land condition to uh, put vegetable everywhere or wheat everywhere. Just to give an example, Europe and Germany is the wheat ground of the world because we have favorable conditions. So we decide here whether we can nutrition the world with wheat worldwide together with Russia, for example. Now, what you see here is a lot of different topics and very defined clear targets from the commission. And the industry, while we speak, is heavily working on this transformation. This goes from, as I said, food, but also circularity. You see topics like renewable energy that is required there is um, preservation of water, soil, and air, but also greenhouse gas emission is a major topic in that regulation. Now, where are the chances? When we looked at these regulations, what we did during the last year, we assessed the risks quantitatively for BSF, for example, but we also looked at the opportunities. And what is interesting, and this is not so pronounced in the public discussion, the Green Deal triggers the development of more than 50 to 100 totally new innovation markets. I brought you here circle economy markets. And what you see, basically, these are markets that grow at a significant higher growth rate than in the past. Because they're pushed by regulation, but they're also in high demand from a lot of customers. And so here are just some examples. Everything around recycling will become a major topic. Everything on, for example, microplastic substitutes, innovation for closed loop thinking. Did you have that in the lecture? I think yes. <laughs> so closed loop will be part of the future. Not easy to do this, but natural plastics, for example, will be the next wave. 
So what you basically see, the, this is just an example of a few markets under the bracket of circle economy. We have exactly the same quantity of markets in transportation of the future, energy systems of the future, and, and, and. So multitude of new opportunities, and this is why choosing this lecture was excellent, because you can tap now into this with a different way of thinking, because that will become the future. Why did I make this entry speech of being clever to choose this lecture? Now, when you go for a second on the meta level of what happens here, and this is the key of the paradigm shift we are in. Basically, we all have been experienced the age of globalization. We spoke about this outside, uh, how this has transformed over time. So all the companies were driven by volume, market share growth. Let's go to China, India, God knows what, yeah, or America, South America. So this was the age of globalization. But what happens now, and the Paris Climate Protocol is the frame for this, people understand we enter a completely decade. And at the center stage of this decade is a very fundamental paradigm shift that most people didn't even completely grasp yet. What is this paradigm shift about? We are at the beginning of a completely S curve, where at the center stage, it's really about smart resource usage on all levels. Why is this a new S curve? Because the Paris Climate Protocol basically also comes with very clear targets, be it CO2. We also all understood, okay, we just have this one planet Earth. So just consuming as if there would be nothing is probably no future. Dieter Rams, I don't know whether you know him, was the designer of Brown and he developed the 10 laws of good innovation and design. And I thought, found it really remarkable that in the 70s, he already quoted the following. He said, you know, the age of consumption without thought, of producing without thought, is just over. We cannot afford this anymore. Just producing, producing, producing for the sake of it. We have in this next decade to think much more deeply because resources are limited. How do we do this in the most efficient way? And this is why this curve is such a big change. And this is why you see so much systemic discussion about it, because there are a lot of people still in the age of globalization, mentally, where profit optimization, volume optimization was the key. But in this new S curve, it's no longer just about volume growth, it's about value growth. And this is a big, big shift. This is a big shift in business administration because this means completely new business models. I talked about closing the loop. How do you earn money in future is a key question for this next S curve. This means we will see much more leasing models. We will see sharing models. The shared economy was just the beginning. We will see a much more fundamental shift in the way value, true value definition is really designed in future. And this is such a big change. That's why I think it's good to know as much as possible about it. It poses, as I showed you with the innovation markets, so many different opportunities, but it needs a totally new view of value creation. So let me show you um, how this could look like. Now, today it's also about impact. And this is directly connected to the curve that I just showed with a paradigm shift. Why is so much changing at the moment? I'll show you a few charts here. When you look at the transition that is necessary, we need 5.5 trillion to reach the transformation in the European Union. And this is why the EU comes up with all these guidelines to restructure also capital markets. Because what you see on this chart here is major paradigm shifts needed by industry, transportation, buildings, and power grid. This is major. Yeah. And this is not an easy transition. That's why the question is, how do you finance this? Now, what we have seen over the last decades is that environmental costs, and there were in 2017, 170 billion environmental costs globally caused by weather-related changes, droughts, all kinds of events. Today, we are at 220 billion. This is just the old figure, just to compare. 117 to 220. We have globally 
more than 240 billion stranded assets. What are stranded assets? These are production facilities that are unable to meet the Paris Climate Protocol target um, and to achieve it. This means we have to change 240 billion of stranded assets, bringing them to the future. This is a major task. And this is why I think it's important that we think this through holistically because capital market at the moment doesn't give nature a value and as long as this is the case we will optimize profit but we will not optimize all levels that need to be optimized now this is changing at the moment because the industry in the capital market is now putting more and more capital into the markets you see this on the left hand side this graph is exponen exponentially growing the so-called ESG investment funds start to grasp this more and more because there's more regulation coming, giving nature a price ticket. Giving profit is already a price ticket, but also giving the whole social topic increasingly a price ticket. That's why ESG funds are on the rise. And just to give you some concrete numbers, in the first quarter in the United States at stock market, 21 billion was traded at the capital market. That's as much as the entire year, um, 2019, for sustainable assets. In Europe, we are by far the continent with most ESG funds worldwide. And this, by the way, in my opinion, is one of the opportunities even we in Germany could use much more. But who is actually buying these ESG funds? And what I found quite interesting is the right-hand side. You see, basically, it's women. <laughs> They are interested in investing in next generations, obviously. Then millennials. The next generation is changing even more because they are much more conscious about environmental impact and people with a high net worth income, which I thought was an interesting curve. Now, when you ask what is the differentiation, the front runners, um, and how can you actually change and impact share price with this? What you basically see, the current positive uptick that can be achieved if you have a clear portfolio driven ESG strategy. So for steel, it's like 14, 14% opportunity to, you know, get bigger in share price. Chemicals is 12, but there's also companies that don't do anything. They defend. And that's why they have a laggard kind of impact on the share price, which is then minus 12, minus 11 and so on. It's not only that you do not have a share price. I brought you one of the most recent studies, how the current share price is composed and what investors look at. This was a regression analysis done by BCG and they looked at more than hundred variables. And what was impressive also to us that today, 17% of the share price of companies by now is already driven by ESG. This number has doubled since 2018 and just gives you a feeling how important this topic is and that it is continuously growing. Now, a lot of this is linked to emission at this point in time, but this topic will become broader to various factors like water, depending on the status quo of where we are. Now, you saw what's changing. Let me again give you a little bit the conception of the reasoning why this is changing. And uh, I guess most of you, a lot of you might have a business background and you probably know the classical concept of shareholder value. And this is actually linked to the curve that I showed in the first part on globalization, driving profit, driving volume. Because at that time in the 90s, it was really about how to create value from a profit perspective. Now, Michael Porter already in the 90s started this shared value concept where he said, maybe it's not good enough just to look at profit only. It's a combination of business environment and societal impact that we have. And we have to think much more how we can create value jointly. Now, what is happening now, and this is this fundamental shift that I was talking about in this curve, in this new S-curve, the paradigm shift, where value is at the center stage. Actually, we are currently moving as a society to a system value approach. What does this mean? The PL that you know today has been invented in 1500. I don't know whether you knew that. By Luca Pacioli, an Italian monk and mathematician. He was a friend of Leonardo da Vinci, and he was the man who was quite wealthy and he kind of looked at Sol und Haben, yeah, what do I have? Uh -huh. Spending, it was this 
bookkeeping principle. What I found pretty interesting, our current system has developed, but not super apart from that basic thought. So what it basically means, we are operating the entire economy based on a system that was invented in 1500, which is not a bad thing. A lot of good things have been developed at the time. But the question is, and this is my challenge to your generation, you know, 10 years ago, we were sitting together and thought, is this actually good enough to steer this entire holistic value? Because at that time, you know, Luca Pacioli didn't know climate change and there was no digitalization. So a lot of things have changed ever since. And we dared, we dared to ask, is this good enough? And so when we were sitting together, and actually we were just three, I have to say, at that point in time, we had a discussion and said, how would you have to think value creation, really? If system value means we have to give nature a value and we have to give humans more value, because humans at the moment are a cost factor in the sheet. Now we tried to calculate that, and that was 10 years ago, and I brought you the original calculation. It, sorry, it looks a bit simple compared to what maybe Christian Heller showed, and I don't know whether he showed anything, but what you basically see, and this is a new way of reporting, when we calculated full supply chain means 70,000 suppliers of BSF, then BSF in the middle, and all custom industries, we found on the profit, that's the orange bars, we generate 60 billion euro across the entire thing. What was interesting to us when we looked at salaries, and if you think macroeconomically, because the issue with the balance sheet is BVL, business administration stops at the frontier of companies. So we give salaries to people and that's a cost. But quite frankly, in society, maybe you and me once in a while go shopping, right? At least at a grocery store. <laughs> and if we do that, we create macroeconomic purchasing authority, purchasing power. This element of value creation is not regarded as a con company contribution, but it actually is. And why is this important? I tell you, COVID-19 showed this very significantly. When you look at what happened during the pandemic, a lot of people were fearing of losing job and then they didn't purchase so much. We both, the maximum we could do, go to the grocery, but we didn't maybe go because the, the shops were closed. It was really difficult. And immediately you had macroeconomic effects on the system. And that is why the state and many states started spending money supporting society, business, and so on and so forth. There you could really see the power of purchasing parity created by companies. Now the capital market doesn't see this as a value yet. It's one of the stabilizing factors of democracies. And I can tell you one thing, the gap is widening. We see, for example, in the United States, specifically in two states, and did now comes the, digitali the digitalization on top, has a major impact on this curve. In Silicon Valley and in New York, where the two states, California and New York, were the two states where the purchasing power of a few individuals went up, but not the majority. So the difference became higher and higher, and one of the outcomes is also that a lot of people in society didn't feel taken along. And when, and when you know, Trump was elected, it were the Clintons and Linda Rothschilds who, together with the financial market, decided to start a new program called inclusive capitalism because they understood the financial market has lost the majority of people because it was a money optimization machine for a few. So what do I try to say here, especially also with a link of digitalization, we have to think more deeply about the consequences. Because if machines reduce costs, which is a good thing, but people are costs, you run in a dilemma. And the question is, what's the right balance of innovation with machine intelligence, but at the same time, how do we keep value and human value yeah, in this equation? Because if nobody, if we would be cut off, because we're both cost factors, I'm a cost factor in my company, you're probably a cost factor to be born at university, right? And if this is optimized over time, our purchasing power, sorry to take you as an example, would go down, right? 
And this would not help the entire economy because robots don't go shopping, at least not yet. Last point, green bars. So 70 billion, 60 billion profit, 70 billion social value. And then the green bars, environmental impact, minus 30 billion across the entire company. Why did we give nature a value in this calculation? Because if you would deforest the Amazonas, the GDP would still go up. And the question is, is that really the right yardstick going forward? Um, because we are basically cutting off our living base. This is why we have some major issues to solve in calculation principles. That's why Sir Ronald Cohen is doing this currently with a small group on the G7 level. Now, BSF also has a footprint, just apologies that there is no bar to the left. We do have a significant uh, ecological footprint to the left, but it's a size issue. We have 70,000 suppliers, one company, and thousands of customers. Now, what can you do with this? Why did we quantify? Because sustainability in its core is not just being more green or just being more, you know, social. This is not sustainability. Sustainability is solving dilemmas and getting the most balanced way to create more value. And for that, you need numbers. And this is why when you look at this analysis, I show you a concrete example how this works. For the first time, you come to a better decision making. Here is a concrete calculation where we wondered, where should we put a production site in, to Poland or to China? And you can see exactly the same calculation, but now specific to a production plant investment. The orange bars show the NPV was pretty much the same. That was more or less coincidental, 45 million. The blue bars show that the value creation, social impact, purchasing power created by wages, just as one example, is higher in Poland than in China. This had a little bit to do with the wage level. But then the environmental costs in China were more negative, meaning higher, because this was a water stressed area. There was not much water. And so in the end, and this is interesting, if you look at the total equation, also from a social and environmental view, the division was better for Poland. And finally, built, we built the catalyst plant in Poland, which is existing today. Now, this is a perfect example that shows how sustainability really works. It's about balancing different factors against each other to solve dilemmas better for the future. It's an overall higher value creation. And for this, you need numbers. And this is why we do it. The beauty of this is you can even put this on a geographical global level by looking at, okay, as BSF, where do we create positive benefits to society in terms of wages and profits? Here you see the countries that are most benefiting from our product grid plus the grid of all customers and suppliers. And where do we actually cause costs to the society? In this case, for example, Brazil is dark red because of the land use that's connected to agricultural solutions, which is very land extensive. But if you know that, you can work on this. But if you don't know, you are in the limbo. And most companies don't know yet where are the key factors to drive sustainability performance. Luckily, um, we also have found a lot of data. So what we have here is, and you don't need to learn this, nobody. I, I hope this is just a, as an example. Yeah? I brought you how deep the data is connected to knowledge. This is a table that we used for this calculation. It was aligned with universities, but also with PwC and many audit companies. And what you basically see is how impact is measured on a deeper level. So in order to see the greenhouse gas emission impact, we basically looked at what are the outcomes that are affected by this and what is the impact on various factors. This is a data model that we have, and we have it for every single country in the world with concrete data filled. That's how we calculate it. Yeah? We have it for greenhouse gas and other elements. Now, luckily, 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 we were not the only company having this crazy thoughts about how to measure value for the future. And so in 2017, when I became board member um, and Christian Heller and myself who worked since 10 years on this topic, we said, you know what? We have heard from the artists that they are doing a similar way of calculating. We have heard from some other companies. The problem is we didn't have a standard. And so we said, why don't we, you know, instead of everyone putting a different method to the world, and I'm really, I'm really for competition, but competition in methodology is a lot of cost. It's actually some cost for everyone. Is it why not putting the best 
methods of all together. And this is why we founded the Value Balancing Alliance, which is now consisting of various industries deliberately and also various geographies. So for example, Mitsubishi is not only a member of this Value Balancing Alliance, they also are interested because Japan is looking at this topic from a wider angle. So there's a lot of connection to the Kidanran and the different industry associations. We have SK Korea, yeah, a company that is very good in social impact measurement, but also Novartis and Caring, they are one of the front leading companies in this sector. Now we are supported by audit companies because if we develop standards jointly, this needs to be auditable. And um, we also work, and I think this we have seen with a lot of external institutions like IFRS, these are the true standard setters that really are happy to have a practitioner group that has piloted this methodology before. And this is why you, historically worldwide, are in a very interesting spot here, because it's the first time ever that this started in Germany. <laughs> for a worldwide movement that is tremendous. Yeah? So this is why I'm so happy to support Mannheim Business School because I believe if we do not bring this super knowledge now into platforms to make you front leading, you will benefit as managers from this know-how. It would be a shame because it's not just about industry inventing stuff together with standard setters and all kinds of premium. It's also about sharing knowledge and preparing for the next wave of growth. So. All in all, we have published these methodologies on the website. If you're interested, I think Wilson has mentioned it as well, on the Value Balancing Alliance, you can see the first methodologies. In these, there are many universities helping us, um, also working on this. Um, beyond Mannheim universities, we work also with Professor Bassen from Hamburg too, but also side business school in the United States and Oxford are behind this methodology paper as well. And with that, I would like to stop here I hope this was a little bit um, giving you an impression why, how, and what we do. If you are interested in concrete examples, because you talk about implementation, I can talk about this in the Q&A, of course. But the key for me is, and this is the takeaway for the next S-curve, business success no longer will just mean optimizing profit. It will mean optimizing value for all three uh, levels, environment, society, and business at the end. With that, thank you very much for your attention.